Good morning. Yeah, everybody just take a deep breath. Y'all doing good? Y'all doing good? It's been, a, it's been kind of a different week, hasn't it? Um, a lot of tragedy uh, in our nation. And, uh, and we certainly want to remember um, all of those folks who lost family members, friends. Los Angeles. So I think this morning we're going to start with a word of prayer and then we'll go into announcements. But just let, let's just take a moment and ask God to, to bless those who have really been struck by tragedy. Father, we come into your presence now and, and it is such a joy for us to gather as a church family. And in the midst of our joy, we want to just stop for a moment and lift before you uh, those who've, who've been affected by the tragic shooting in Las Vegas this week, Lord. We pray and ask that you would minister comfort and peace and begin to heal the emotions of those who've lost loved ones and friends. And, and Lord, we just pray and ask that you would, uh, you would just begin to uh, heal them. May they sense not only your love, but the love of your people, of your body, gathering even this morning all over this nation and, and lifting them before your throne in prayer. We pray and ask that you would wrap your loving arms around them, draw them close to you, and Lord, may you minister in such a way that there is no doubt in their heart that there is a loving God who cares for them. And Lord, we just pray and ask that you would, uh, you would bring healing in every situation and to our nation as well. Now we ask that you would help us as we gather together today. Lord, we, we want to praise you. We want to experience the joy of salvation to its fullest. In Christ's name, amen. And so uh, uh, we, we've had a good week. It's gotten a little cooler. It's been nice, hasn't it? And we had some rain, yeah. Yeah, we've been praying for rain, and the uh, and Lord answers prayer. So uh, that's that's been a good thing. And uh, it just feels like fall, doesn't it? Just starting to feel like fall. That's a good thing. Good. Well, if you have some announcements, let's make our way forward so we can get those out of the way. I will start as you come forward. Uh, this Wednesday, following choir practice, we're going to have a, a nominating committee meeting. So if you can show up for that, uh, it's after choir practice. I don't expect it to be a, a lengthy, long meeting. Uh, but if you can do that, that'd be great. And also, starting on October 18th, um, following choir practice as well, we'll be starting our men's Bible study. And uh, and the first little while, we discuss the Beast Feast and start planning for that. So uh, you want to make sure you get here, guys, to be a part of that and to be a part of the study. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a really good one uh, this time. And so... Uh, I just invite you out. Mark your calendars for that. Good morning. Y'all received the flyer on the Big Kid information. We are getting excited. This is this Saturday. If you have not been over to the fellowship hall to look at all the, the items over there, you have to go check it out. There are some awesome items. Just to review what's going to be happening this week, um, the Big Kid is on Saturday at 5.30 with a meal of pulled pork, baked beans, coleslaw, and chips. And then we'll have tea and water. And on Wednesday, the tent is coming from 5.15 to 5.30. Rod will be here to show them where to put it. Um, they said they could use a little extra help, but it's not necessary. And then on Friday, Around 6.30, I think Brenda may be here at 6, so if you're here a little bit early, but at 6.30, we're going to set up the tables. The tables are going to stay on the trailer when they bring it Wednesday, and then we'll pull them out on Friday evening. We'll also pull the chairs from the bank building over to put them under the tent with the tables. So we'll set up the tables 
and um, do that Friday evening. And then Saturday, pastors contacted the people with their food, and they know what they're doing. If you signed up to do um, any other prep or serving, we'd like you here at 4 to 4.30 on Saturday. And that will be getting the water, the tea, the paper goods, the trash containers, and helping pastor get set up and instructions on your serving. And then after the auction, um, after the auction, we're just going to clear the tables and clean up the kitchen and take care of the trash. And we will not move the tables and chairs until Sunday on the 15th after church because it's going to be dark by the time the auction's done. So we don't want to be moving things around and people tricking. So uh, next Sunday after uh, church and Sunday school, we'll pick up all the tables and chairs. Okay? And I will uh, uh, be getting with those who are going to help you cook, that are actually cooking, I'll be getting your stuff to you this week and along with the recipes. And uh, uh, it, it'll be a good time. Um, and it, it, we try to make it as low maintenance as possible. But we are actually going to be serving this meal. So we're going to need servers here on Saturday, as uh, Ginger stated. So um, it's going to be fun. And it's going to be a, a, a lot of uh, uh, good fellowship as well. Uh, if you notice in your bulletin as well, I'll remind you that on October 30th, that's a Monday evening at 6.30, uh, Hillsboro United Methodist Church will be having our church conference at that on that date. And uh, it will be a collective conference, so there will be a lot of churches there. Um, all of the churches, I believe, in, in Marion County as well as some outside the county. So, uh, uh, just to remind you of that, if you would like to attend, if you don't want to attend, I understand. <laughs> but uh, if you're looking for an evening to take your wife out, guys... This will be the this will be the opportunity to do it. Date night. Date night, absolutely. Also, October twenty second in your bulletin, the youth group will be um, going to the judgment house and then going shopping for Operation Christmas Child boxes. Right? Any time they're supposed to meet here? No, we'll leave right after Sunday school. Leave right after Sunday school. So, if you want some friends to go, bring them along. It'll be a good time. Any other announcements? I've got the lighter side. All right. Of the announcements, you know. We, we can't go without having a little bit of a laugh this morning, so. I did find one, or dig one out of the files to share. A Sunday school teacher asked her class, what was Jesus' mother's name? One child answered, Mary. Then the teacher asked, who knows what Jesus' Jesus's father's name was? A little kid said, Verge. Confused, the teacher asked, Where did you get that? The kid said, Well, you know, they're always talking about Verge and Mary. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> it's a good thing this goes out on television. Too. <laughs> I don't know, even know how to follow that. So <laughs> I guess we'll just go with the birthdays. Anybody grow older? Hey, all right. Come on down. How about an anniversary? Which, by the way, we want to thank you for all the anniversary cards. We sat down, read through them all. They were great. And the pastor appreciation cards, we appreciate you folks. We enjoy being your pastoral family. I don't know if we picked that up, but we had a lot of fun doing it. So 
Thank you very much. And I got an extra treat. I got a whole plate of Betty Jess cookies. And I told Don the other day, I, I, I had some. I've been kind of rationing them out, you know, to make them last longer. And so I came in, and somebody in my family found out they, that I had them. Because as of Friday, I only had two left. So I'm, I'm still under investigation. I don't want to say a whole lot right now. Still under investigation, but that was a treat for, for me. I did share one or two with my wife, Betty. Well, let's prepare our hearts for what God has for us today. He's got something great for each one of us.
verses 1 through 5. Pray to the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He sets the earth upon its foundation and can never be moved.
is God besides the Lord, and who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. Yeah. moment in the service and we ask you to just consume this place with your presence like the air that is in our each of our lungs that we so desperately need each breath that we take may we breathe in you and breathe in your word may we know that it's not just another Sunday that we just showed up at church because we are creatures of habit May it be that you have something for each one of us here to hear from Pastor Jeff's message or from a song that is sang or from the smile on a children, child's face. Just be with us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Kids, it's your time to come on down. Okay, I want you guys to go ahead and take the wrappers off. Okay, but don't don't suck on them yet. Okay, we have a few that are we've got ahead of me a little bit, but the rest of you guys are doing great. So if you take your wrappers off, here I'll take the trash. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, now these, I got a few more instructions for you. Hang on, just don't lick your suckers yet, okay? I'm going to talk to you about something. Thank you. We're going to talk about self control. <laughs> do you guys, you guys may not understand why everybody else is laughing, but do you know what self control is? What, what do you think it is, Trip? You you can't do that thing you want to do, but you can't do it. That was a very good definition. Yeah, self-control. I was trying to think of the best way to put that for you guys, but that's really good. Self-control is doing what's right, even when we don't necessarily feel like doing what's right. And sometimes that even means not doing something that we feel like doing, holding back. Especially as an adult, it gets to be that way. But um, so, what what would be an example of that? Do you guys have any idea what I'm talking about? Like if um, taking control of your body, that's right. Taking control of your actions, right, Trip, and what you do. So, like if you're in line at school, standing around with your best bud, and someone else comes and cuts in line and stands in between you and your friend. You might feel like, what, what would you feel like doing if that happens? What would you do? What would you do, Tragen? Somebody cut in line in front of you. You would be mad, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's normal. We, we have emotions like that. That would make me mad, too. Yes. But then we have a choice. We can either be mad and retaliate against that person by pushing them out of the way, taking our place back in line, or maybe even saying something rude to them. But if we have self-control, what would we do then if we had self-control? What do you think, Brian? Okay. 
If, if we have self-control, maybe we would hold back and we just let that other person be in line there. Say, well, you know, even though it makes me mad, that's okay. I'm not going to do anything back. Right? Does that make sense? There's a couple of verses in the Bible that talk about self-control and why God wants us to have self-control. Why do you think he wants us to have self-control? What kind of a world would this be if we didn't have self-control? If I bumped you and then you hit me back. <coughs> yeah, that wouldn't be very nice, would it? Or if you said something to me and I didn't like it and I said, well, you're just a jerk. And, uh, and I don't like you very much, and you look funny. You know? <laughs> Sometimes we're tempted to say things like that, but we need to have self-control so that we can show God's love to others. In Romans, the Bible tells us to honor each other above ourselves. So even though somebody hurts us or somebody makes us mad, we need to maybe just let it go and still try to be friendly and try to show God's love. There's also a verse in 2 Peter that talks about self-control and how it's an important part of our spiritual growth. We can't grow up in the spirit if we don't have self-control. It's one of the steps. And I am so proud of you guys. Most of you did not even suck on your suckers. I'm so proud of you. And that is a perfect example of self-control. So you guys can put those in your mouth and we're going to pray. Okay? Lord Jesus, we thank you for bringing us each here today. We thank you so much that you make it possible for us to be here, to worship you, to know you, and to grow in your word. And Lord, I thank you especially for each one of these children as they strive to grow, to know you, and to do the right thing. Lord, I just pray that you will be with them to guide them. And and also, Lord, be with the parents of these children to help them grow up to know you and to know your word and, and what it says. So, Lord, we just thank you for this day and for this time to be here in this message. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. And at this time, the children can be dismissed to Children's Church and the Christian Ed team met this week. Kindergarten through fifth will be in, over in Children's Church. So if they're in kindergarten, they can go over in Children's Church. And, and infants through four years old or up until they're in kindergarten can go down to the nursery. Dear Lord, it's been a busy long week for many of us here. This week's had its tragedies, it's had its sorrows, it's had its laughs and good times, but Lord, help us to be in this very moment right now. To realize that the heart that is beating in each of our chests right now is a gift from you. That everything that we have in this world, the sunrise this morning, the ability to drive to church this morning, it all comes from you, Lord. Now help us to give back the gift to you and help us to see this gift multiply in folds that we can't even imagine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This time we'll share some joys and concerns. Father, we count it an honor and a privilege to be able to come to you, not just on Sunday morning as we gather together as a family, but we can come to you any time. We're always in your presence, and we thank you for that. We pray and ask that you would, uh, each and every day, make us aware of your presence in our life. Lord, we, we have much to share. There have been many requests. Lord, we, we ask that you would be with those that are struggling with cancer. Lord, those that have been mentioned here this morning, we ask that you would just... Uh, minister through the doctors to their body. Lord, we pray and ask that you would uh, you would just bring honor and glory to yourself and, and Lord, that you would increase our faith and the faith of those that we pray for, Lord. And Lord, uh, we just uh, lift Clint before you and we pray and ask that you would just minister to him uh, losing part of your finger pray and ask that you would just heal that. I know it's frustrating, especially for somebody who uses their hands as much as, as cowboys do. And we just pray and ask that you would just uh, minister to his body, but to his spirit as well. Lord, be with Sarah. And uh, we pray and ask that you would just use her to minister to plant. Uh, Lord, uh, for each of these requests, we just bring before your throne and we ask that you would just minister as only you can. And, uh, and Lord, we lift our nation before you. It seems as, as though uh, tragedy strikes far too often. And I pray and ask that you would just minister to those as we prayed earlier, that uh, lost loved ones. Lord, we pray too and ask that you would heal our nation. Speak to the hearts not only of our leaders, but of the people of our nation. Give us a hunger for your Holy Spirit. Lord, draw us back to you. I pray and ask that you would let a great awakening once again happen in our nation. Within our church, may it start here. May it spread out. Lord, we just ask that you would make yourself known to this world in a powerful way. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come to you in prayer and to approach your throne of grace. Knowing that you are our Father and that you love us, that you hear and answer our prayer, John writes. Lord, I pray and ask that you would help us to grow in our faith. Help us to be the dispensers of grace and not just the receptacles. Help us to pour out into others what you pour into us through your Holy Spirit, through your Word. Lord, give us the courage we need to stand strong. We thank you and praise you for your love and your grace and your mercy in our life. We ask that in those areas that we need forgiveness in, that we lift those things before your throne, that we would confess and repent and seek your forgiveness. Lord, where there needs to be encouragement, where there needs to be an edification, a building up of our faith, we pray and ask that you would do that. There are things that we hold so deeply within us that we don't feel like we can share them. They're the unspoken prayers that are going up right now. We pray and ask that you would hear the hearts cry. Lord, be with us throughout the rest of the service. 
open our hearts to the truth of your word, to the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we go throughout this week, help us to be bright and shining lights in a lost and dying world. And Lord, let us take the heart of prayer you taught the disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of prayer. singing in uh, the Metropolitan Baptist Church at Wichita had a Sunday school class party. It was a, a Valentine's party. And we sang at this party. And the next year they invited us back to sing again. And after we sang the second night, a guy came up to me and he, uh, he said, Do you remember me? Well, you remember somebody when you met hundreds of people during the year. You know, and I told him, no, I'm sorry. I, I just don't remember you. And he said, well, anyhow, he said, I've got a story that I want to tell you. He said, I was here last year when you sang here. And he said, it was Valentine's Day, and he said, I didn't go to church. But my wife invited us, invited me to come, and he said, being the good guy that I am, I decided that I better go and appease her, you know. So he said, I came, and he said, uh, that summer I went home, and he said, I like the fish, and Dan, he had to be a good guy, <laughs> if he liked the fish, you know. But he said, my way of fishing is different than a lot of people. He said, I like to go out on a reservoir at night and fish by myself, all by myself, <coughs> and just enjoy the follows of being there alone. And he said, uh, I was fishing on this reservoir, and I don't know if any of you have been out here on the reservoir when the wind goes to the northwest all of a sudden, and those waves get about that high. He said, that's what happened to me. He said, at 2 o'clock in the morning, the wind changed, came up, and he said, I was at the mercy of the wind. And he said, it wasn't very long before my boat capsized. And he said, I was in the water. He said, I was alone. No way of contacting him. But and he said, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. He said, luckily the boat was floating upside down and I could hold on to it. But he said, what am I going to do? And he said, I began to think of a song that you guys had sung the previous year. It was talking there about Jesus being the lighthouse. And he said, I didn't have an altar to kneel at and pray. But he said, I realized that I was not in right relationship <coughs> with God. And he said, hanging on the side of that boat was my altar. 
And he said, I hear you twice. So Jesus. And he looked at that time in the distance, and it just happened to be the way I was going. I could see a light. And he said, I focused on that light. And with the wind and everything being just right, he said, I headed towards that light. He said, I don't know how long I was there. But he said, suddenly, my feet touched the ground, and the light disappeared. He said, that's not coincidence. He said, that is God's perfection. So we're going to do that song, and think about that as we do this. We can get everything going right here, maybe.
Today's uh, scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 33 and 34. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. And the second one is Ezekiel. Unfortunately, I'm at the mercy of the computer man back there. There we go. Ezekiel 37, verses 1 and 6, one through 6. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out, of, out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many, bone, a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophecy, Prophesy to the, these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Get yourself cleared up here. You made me cry. <laughs> I love that song, and uh, brings back a lot of memories, too. So. We're going to be continuing our look at uh, an awakening. I don't know if you sense it. I do. My heart uh, became heavy last Monday. Monday, after hearing the news of what took place, uh, it was almost as if the Holy Spirit began to just reaffirm the fact that we need Jesus more today than ever. And so, my heart's been kind of heavy all week long, and uh, because I want us to look at that cycle of sin and repentance. And we can see it through the scriptures. That's that's where we see it a lot. You see the Israelites, you know, they, they get delivered, they come out of Egypt, they're out of bondage, and it's not soon long after before they're complaining, Oh God, you know, you brought us out here to die and and they make a golden calf. They 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 take things into their own hands and they think that they know better than God and all of a sudden God has to discipline them and they repent and they go well for a little while and then there's the sin again and then there's repentance and there's this cycle. And we see it with in the Scriptures with the children of Israel, but you can see it in your own life too. Let's get down and real here. You've had those moments, those seasons where you're you're just on this high with God. You're, you're you feel His presence. You're. It seems as though the Scripture just comes alive. It seems as though your prayer life is vital. You're excited about church. And, and you, you're listening to Caleb. <laughs> Inspiring and encouraging. There's a brother who listens to it. Too. It's good to have you here today, Rick. Too. Let, me, let me just recognize Rick Just He joined our praise band this morning. It's good to have him here with us. And so we get a... We get a Another voice in the Amen corner. <laughs> but we get into that, that cycle ourselves and, and everything is going good. And, and then we just kind of, because things are going good, we don't, we don't, we feel like, well, God, I got it handy from here. And then pretty soon, we're not reading the Bible. It's not alive to us. Pretty soon our prayers 
are just kind of, then all of a sudden, they're not there anymore. And so we go through these cycles of sin and repentance and, and even not just neglecting prayer and, and Scripture and, and maybe we start missing church more and more often. We need the strength of each other. I'm just telling you. I'm a firm believer in church. You know, I don't know how it is with y'all around here, but if I was a coyote, if I was a coyote, I'm going to be looking for the sheep that's away from the fold. And so to say, we isolate ourselves because we think, well, we can handle it. We need the strength of one another. And so I'm a firm believer, man. Go to church, even when you don't feel like it. That's when you need to be there alone. But even aside from that, we get all of those things that begin to fall away in our lives, and then we begin to do things that we know that we shouldn't do. We lack then, wherever Dawn is, the self-control. And we indulge in things that we know is not right. And then we come back to God. And there is a personal level of sin and repentance in everybody's life. And you, you find that as a nation. We see it in the children of Israel. Uh, I firmly believe in Ezekiel chapter 37 when, I, can you imagine being Ezekiel and, and going to the valley of dry bones and there's just, you know, they didn't go through and, and bury everybody when there was a battle. There's just this valley of dry bones there and, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, the ears told to prophesy to them. Now, I preach to a lot of people. I've even been in a, a few churches that were so cold. I remember when we was traveling with the band, you remember Jim, he, he took the microphone, one of our guitar players. Uh, you could just feel the spirit was trying to break through and one of our guitar players uh, grabbed the microphone and said, you know, I've been in a lot of churches, but I've never been in the church of the frozen chosen. <laughs> And things heated up then. <laughs> I just started laughing. He said, I, I remember he said, he says, we need to change the church sign on a lot of churches. Church of the frigid air. <laughs> but I, I preach to a lot of, of different congregations, but I never preach to a valley of dry bones. I've never had that opportunity and I thank God for that um, but when we look at our nation and I want to draw it down I'm going to give you a little history lesson this morning in our nation historians believe that there are about there are four great awakenings so far they call them awakenings the first one uh, was great and it, depending on who you read uh, and you know uh, what historian uh, you're reading from, especially a church historian, uh, you'll get a different uh, feel for who was involved. But I, I do want to lay the groundwork just a little bit because most people don't know the, the, intricacy, the intricate weaving of, of biblical precepts into our very, our nation. I'm, not just Israel in the Bible, but our nation. In 1620, when those pilgrims came over on the Mayflower, and, and it's getting that time of year, isn't it? Turkey time. We're getting there. When they came over, there's about 50 that made it across that came over. And they came with the intention of not separating themselves from uh, a nation. They came with the intention of sparking revival in the Anglican church at that time. They were hoping to be a city upon a hill. Ronald Reagan, in one of his speeches, refers to that. He was making a historical reference. Their purpose, John Winthrop writes in his diary, 
was to be a city on the hill. They had an errand in the wilderness in which God sent them, they felt, to be a model for the rest of the world. That was in 1620. Their hope was not to break from England, but rather to save it through the power of their example. William Bradford, who led the pilgrim's journey to the New World, equated their trek to that of Moses and the Israelites when they went out of Egypt. He said, Our fathers were Englishmen which came over this great nation. And we were ready to perish. But they cried out to the Lord and He heard their voice. And so they sought to build a society that, was, that reflected biblical precepts. Is that new to anybody? You ever hear that talk today? When people say, I, I, I'm just going to tell you, this isn't a political message at all. And if you think it is, I'm sorry. You probably get over it. But I think that for us to understand the crisis that we're in, we need to understand how we were, how our country was founded, I should say people searching to live their lives in such a way that, that their everyday life reflected biblical precepts. And so they, they sought out to establish uh, everyday lifestyle and found it in the Word of God. And so there was a moral foundation that they, they wanted to establish. I am one, think ill of me if you like, that's okay. I am one who believes in Christian exceptionalism. I believe that God not only saves us so that we can can enter into a relationship with Him, but He saves us with the purpose of being His disciples to win the rest of the world to the good news of Jesus saving grace at Calvary. I believe that that is our calling, our destiny. You don't have to be a preacher to preach on Sunday morning to be a witness of what Jesus Christ is in your life and who He is and the power that He can give you. I believe that every believer is, in, is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. You have power today to be a witness and to be the tool of transformation by the very hand of God. Don't get so excited that you blow me off the stage here. This is, this is something that the world says, no, no, we're just another religion. That's just a, it's just another religion. It's just like anything else. You can't say that you're exceptional. You can't say that you have a spiritual destiny. Well, that will offend some others. I'm telling you, this is what the Word of God tells us. We need to embrace it. We need to live it. And we need to not be ashamed of it for certain. Amen. Woo! I tell you what, no one else say it, I'll say it. That's good preaching. And if I could stomp my foot, I would. <laughs> <laughs> the colonial folk, those early folk, thought that they had and they believed that they were called by God to establish a nation not like any other nation that was founded on precepts found in the Scripture that even if those who lived in the society that was created, that they were trying to build, even those who lived in that society that maybe didn't believe in God, they would still reap the benefits 
of the biblical principles that they were founding the nation on. The principles of liberty. The principles of freedom. The principles of morality. Why do you think, if you go to our nation's capital, there are scripture verses on all of the great buildings? Even in con uh, Congressional Hall, there's a statue of Moses. There is verses of scripture there because it is interwoven in our nation's fabric. And so they felt that they they were exceptional. And come along about 1740 to 1760, there was this first great awakening, and it was sparked by, believe it or not, a Methodist. <laughs> <clears throat> One of Wesley's colleagues, George Whitfield, started preaching. He preached out in the open fields. He preached where anyone would listen. Another minister who was very prominent during that time period, that first great awakening, was a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Edwards. And he preached a famous message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And when you read accounts of it, they were there were people who, who wrote and, and were there. They said that there were people gripping. You see that post back there that's holding up the balcony. You guys, doing good. We got you covered. <laughs> it's holding up the balcony. They wrote in their journals that there are apparently these pillars in his church. And, and people just thought that as he was preaching this message that the, the floor was going to open up and that they were going to fall into hell. And there were people grabbing a hold of these posts. Can you imagine that? Woo! I would love to have been there for that one. <laughs> and there were thousands of people who were coming to Christ. George Whitfield was preaching to fields and, and he, they say he had such a booming, loud voice. He's probably related to the just. <laughs> and people came to Christ. Because in that time period, from the time that they, uh, the pilgrims and the early settlers landed in places like Plymouth Rock that we're familiar with and Jamestown, Virginia that we're familiar with. In, in that time period, there were those who, who life and communal life and communities, they became uh, uh, distant from God. And there, there needed to be a repentance. They had fallen into that sin and repentance cycle. I can give you more, but I won't. I want to go on to the Second Great Awakening. From about 1800 to 1831, there's a Second Great Awakening. And once again, depending on which church historian you're reading, it starts, it really starts in a place in Kentucky, of all places. And once again, there's some Methodists involved. And they're traveling through. These itinerant pastors, preachers, evangelists are traveling through. And they come across this little settlement in a little place, little known place called Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And in fact, there isn't even a church building there. They just open air preach. And they start preaching. And people get saved. And they ask. I studied this and in fact, it scared some of the ministers that were in the class with us. It was funny. I took it at a master's level, church history, and it was it was just funny. I started laughing because you know people never heard this kind of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and so there were these people got saved, and, and so when the itinerant ministers came back, he brought some other ministers. Some were Presbyterian. 
And you had the Methodists over here, and you had the Presbyterians over here. In fact, they didn't even have a pulpit to preach from. They cut down trees, stood up on the stump, preached. So you had people, and people were coming from all over. And now thousands were getting saved. And, and each year it started getting a little bit bigger and bigger. Some accounts say that there were more than 10,000 people one time. And what happened was the Holy Spirit would get a hold of people because of the sin and repentance cycle. The Holy Spirit would get a hold of people and they had, and it's recorded, and they used this phrase, the jerks, the jumps, and the shouts. Alcoholics that had bottles of whiskey in their back pocket while they're hearing the preacher preach, they fell under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, pulled these bottles out and busted them. Men who got so under conviction, they ran through the woods screaming and shouting for God to forgive them. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. And He is the same Holy Spirit that's alive today if we will open up and respond to Him. We need a great awakening. Paul was right. Evil company will corrupt good habits. That's good advice. My mama said it this way. Birds of a feather. Ooh, you guys are on it. <laughs> She'd say, Jeff, pick your friends wisely. Because they'll reflect your character. Ooh. I can still hear her saying that to me while sewing at her really, really old singer sewing machine that would be considered an antique now. And with her glasses down like this and her fat little fingers running that material through the sewing machine and just never breaking to look at me but just talking and giving me sage advice as I was a kid growing up. It spread the second grade awakening. In fact, uh, uh, it, it spread on through Ohio and up into New York and, and it spread everywhere. There's a third great awakening. You're going to have to come back next week to hear it. <laughs> there is a fourth, too, that takes us all the way up to the year 2000. The third one, the third one, wow, it creates all kinds of upheaval in our society. What I, the reason I share this with you is this. When you look at what's happening on the news, when you hear the talking heads on the radio or on the television, understand it within the context of which it is placed. These, this is a world reporting crisis without the hope of Jesus. All they see is doom. All they hear are arguments of conflict. All it does is become one political side to another. But there is a God who sits on the throne, who has the power to heal, that has the power to take that which Satan meant for evil, and he can use it for good. I don't know if y'all read the blog that I print each week on the church website. Yeah, I, there might be three or four of you. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? Anybody know where that line's from? Only the shadow. The shadow. <laughs> If you read that article, Shadow is a fictional character. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? God does. 
who has the capability of defeating the evil that lurks in the hearts of men? God does. How does he defeat it? Through his church. You and I taking this gospel message of Jesus Christ, His love, His grace, His mercy, and His forgiveness, and we take it to a lost and dying world who desperately needs to hear the hope that Jesus offers. You and I. You and I. Are the hope. Because we carry the very presence of the Savior. Stand with me. And we're going to sing with gusto once again. A great song that I love. I wish we sang it more than just at Easter time. And so because I think that, I put it in the program. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives. Not yesterday. Not 2,000 years ago. He lived then. But He lives today. And if you and I will allow the living presence of Jesus Christ to burst forth from our life, the world can experience a great awakening. I believe it. Let's sing it. the presence of the living Jesus, I just invite you to pray as I pray, Lord, come in. Forgive me of our sin. Forgive me of my 
rebellion. And Lord, I pray and ask that you would just be my Savior today. You pray those words, and I tell you what, liberty will flood your soul. Lord, I thank you and praise you for your presence, for your goodness. You truly live, and we're thankful. What would this world be without your presence in it? Imagine what it would be like. Lord, I pray and ask that you be with us as we go throughout this week. May we go with the joy of the Lord resounding in our heart. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.